This episode of Search Your Library is brought to you by using the toilet during a commander game. No one's going to attack a player who's not there. To Fairy's protection, $20. The bathroom, free. In 2019, the magic set Throne of Eldraine introduced the world to food tokens. Food are artifact tokens you can sacrifice to gain 3 life. Original reactions to food were negative. By itself, life gain is weak. It delays the inevitable without advancing your game plan. Food seemed worse than clue and treasure tokens, which drew cards and provided mana. But food quickly got out of hand. First, it was a resource for powerful cards, like Gilded Goose and Oko, Thief of Crowns. And because it was stapled to otherwise strong cards, food let players outlive their opponents, while still advancing their board. But enough about playability. This video is about flavor. Pun highly intended. The existence of food makes sense. Eldraine was based on fairy tales which feature food-based magic. But why does eating heal you after a worm attack or fireball? That isn't how food works. Or is it? This is the story of how food became synonymous with healing. We'll dive into the history of gaming and explore the real-world dynamics of food medicine. Do you know where the cookbook section is? Because it's time to search your library. Let's start by talking about what food heals hit points. Today, hit points, or HP, are a familiar mechanic. Their origin is in early war games where they represented a ship or tank's integrity. Human beings were more fragile, each soldier only had one hit point. But when formalizing the rule set of Dungeons and Dragons, Dave Arneson chose to make the scope individual characters. To keep D&D strategic and variable, these characters got the hit points previously held by entire vessels. HP represents both a character's health and fighting spirit. It's an abstraction. You start at some number, attacks reduce it, and at zero, you either die or fall unconscious, depending on the rule set. But how do you bring it back up? Early game manuals mention rations as an adventuring necessity, but they didn't heal. This promoted realism, but became busy work. One cleric spell even created food and water. By level 5, rations become irrelevant. Now, those clerics did have access to healing magic. This was a reference to holy figures in religion and mythology who had power over both domains. The first healthy consumables were potions. In the original rulebook's table, health potions were one of many. But their utility stood out against, say, plant control. With health low and the cleric busy, health potions became key to the combat system. But potions are also magical, so they seem distinct from mundane food. For the first instance of healing food, we have to go digital. The first computer games were concurrent with D&D. Each inspired the other. Some of the earliest were text RPGs, like 1970's Pettit 5 and D&D. These included many familiar mechanics, like classes, spells, and of course, hit points. The first game with named food was 1975's Moria. In Moria, players had to maintain rations to continue taking steps. Like in D&D, food points were separate from health. But enforced by the game, food actually became necessary. This mechanic lived into several other games, including Rogue, the eponymous roguelike, the first game with actual healing food was 1981's Catacombs. Catacombs had just one stat, strength. Both moving and being hit reduced strength, while food recovered it. This is why food became healing, 
It was another abstraction, combining several related concepts into one. From here, food continued to become more and more common in games. Gauntlet's voice lines called out low health with a robotic Warrior needs food badly. Castlevania became infamous for its hidden wall meat. And 38 years after Moria, food tokens keep you in the game three life at a time. Today, the mechanic is so common that there's a TV trope about it. Hyperactive metabolism. The page calls out the fantasy of the mechanic. Eating, and sometimes even drinking, heals you, rather than just filling you up and giving you some energy. So now we're back to the original question. Why the f does food heal you? Well, here's the thing. As I did research for this episode, I began to realize that this viewpoint, and my own, were missing something. To me, food and drugs were mostly separate entities. Food comes on a plate, medicine comes in a bottle. But this isn't true for everyone. In fact, my own uncle is an Ayurvedic doctor in Sri Lanka. Many of his prescriptions are spice blends incorporating ginger and coriander. TV tropes and I were ignoring that to people like my uncle, food is healing. To understand this perspective, I turned to the field of nutritional anthropology. Nutritional anthropology sits at the intersection of biology, economics, politics, and history. And today's guest is a nutritional anthropologist whose research is right at the heart of our question. My name is Miguel Cu. I am from Guatemala. I am a PhD student at Vanderbilt University in the anthropology department. I am focusing on food anthropology slash nutrition anthropology, specifically with Kichimaya women population here in Guatemala. Together, we explored that blurred line between food and medicine. Thank you for joining me, Miguel. Let's start with the basics. At a high level, how does nutritional anthropology define food? We could see food as a biological object, as well as cultural and social item. If we see uh, the food as a biology object, we could only start the food through the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and vitamins and minerals. But if we see food as a cultural and social object, we could describe the food and only start the food through the linguistic, cultural, and social aspect, and even economical aspect that shapes the lives of the human beings. We're talking today because of a common trope in gaming where food acts as a healing item. What is the Mayan perspective on food as medicine, and what does that look like in practice? Food is the first medium to the process of healing, because healing is a holistic process and social process beyond to provide health. My favorite examples here in Guatemala is when someone has some stomach pain, they say, you have cool in the stomach. So you need to drink a hot beverage or hot food. And that is a kind of food that's medicine. That reminds me a lot of my understanding of comfort foods. Many of the things that I eat when I'm sick are warm, like hot soup or buttery pasta. That is a good term, comfort food, but in the sense of healing to provide love. Which ties back to the social aspect of healing you mentioned, someone caring for you and providing that hot soup. I'd like to talk about your specific research next. There's this idea that people in other countries only use food-based medicine because they don't understand nutrition. How does your research challenge that? Indigenous population don't speak English terminology or Spanish terminology, you know? They speak the old language that have the logics that they have for food. When I ask Kichimaya women here in the ground, what do they know about nutrition? They say, now we tam tag. That is a kitsche word to say, I don't know. But when I ask about food, they recognize the concept of nutrition. The indigenous or local language that people speak in the local community is a key window to promote good health and good nutrition. Ichag is vegetables for nourishment, but they have the concept of cayes, that is, will plants that nourish and also provide healing. 
For example, we have apazote. Apazote helps clean the, the body for lumps or pain in the stomach. The properties of plants like apazote, has there been an effort to understand their effects? The Western perspective that we usually know as medicine is a biased concept. We have this Western knowledge system to say, yeah, they have something, but it's not enough versus pills. Local universities, they describe this kind of wild plants and the kind of antibiotics properties that these plants have. The local people know that, that these plants have something to heal. The first tip to us as scientists, uh, medical providers or health providers, we need to understand them to understand the food. We could this match what we know to provide a better approach for nutrition and health. That kind of research sounds really important. One thing that I realized while preparing for this interview was how much of modern medicine is based on food-based cures, the most famous example being the lemon. That was the first medicine for escorbuto because we need vitamin C to provide a specific uh, food deficits. That is, I think, the biggest step to match this kind of to knowledge, the indigenous knowledge or local knowledge versus global biomedical knowledge, is the systematization and knowledge of this knowledge. What are some other examples of indigenous knowledge around food? Spicy food, um, acid food, when you add lemon or orange to the food, you could preserve this kind of food and in some ways, some vitamins and minerals. In Guatemala, if you eat black beans, with tomato sauce and you add lemon, you could promote iron stability for this meal. You could expose the iron for a better absorption in the body. And in another way, you preserve a little bit the food. This is something that is popular, but we have a logic behind that. Another source of healing we've discussed is spirituality. How does that appear in the Mayan tradition? Something that is very particular is like the religious practice of corn. The milpa system or the corn system, they celebrate Maya ceremonies when they begin the harvesting of corn. And they celebrate when they make the first tortilla or tamal from that harvesting. The Popol Vuh is a kitchen Maya book that describes the origins of the kitchen Maya population. And in one chapter, they describe how human beings were created from cup or the corn. So if you understand the map region in West America, you need to understand the core. Even right now, some family lose that, they recognize and acknowledge the core. For example, some popular uh, nicknames that they give to the corn-based food is like the holy tortilla, la santa tortilla. Some viewers may watch this video and have the knee-jerk reaction that food-based medicine is dated, especially if they only hear about it in the context of alternative medicine scams. What's your response to that viewpoint? In this global economic model that we have, oh, we need to recognize that the food fills that space when we do have money, right? The big example that I have on my mind right now is what happened with COVID. High income countries have access so quickly, so easy for this kind of vaccine. Versus the low income countries, we have a lot of problems to access to vaccines, treatment, etc. Right? Here in Guatemala, they promote some local teas to say, okay, we could promote a better immunological system with this kind of food. So in that sense, food fill the in access to this kind of pills and vaccination. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the Mayan community? The Maya population that we have, they are not the same that 20, 30 years ago. And we still have this old indigenous population, you know, the land, the mountains, the ravines, the trees. You know, the Maya population, they have access to education. They have access to better jobs. Not all the Maya population, they have access to these things. We have Maya physicians, we have Maya lawyers here in the community. We still have some problems, a huge problems, but we are not the same. Something that I want to explore beyond my food focus right now is the Maya population that access to digital media, new technologies, and they promote culture, language, and food healing practice through Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all these things. And, and they speak the Maya language. It's very important to see how the, the Maya is the same, but with, we are not the same that 20, 30 years ago.
So what did we learn today? In gaming, food began as abstraction. It went from a source of stamina to a health item as a matter of convenience for designers. But this is a somewhat biased view. As Miguel said, food is the first medicine to the process of healing. To some cultures, that is an explicit connection. It arises both because of long-held traditional knowledge and persists where modern medicine isn't viable. But even in the biomedical perspective, that link exists, and we can see many of those pathways of healing in Magic's food tokens. Randy Gallegos' fruit spread contains the vitamins you need after planeswalking. The warmth of Steve Prescott's soup fights the cold in your stomach. And Aaron Miller's demonic aspic, maybe that tastes just like the ones your mother made. It's your comfort food. So the next time you crack open a food token, consider that you're engaging in a metaphor with decades of history and worldwide appeal. I'd like to thank today's guest, Miguel Ku, for sharing his research and field work. He was actually calling from the Maya community in Guatemala. Additional thanks to Chester Bolingbroke, writer of the CRPG Addict. He answered some of my questions about early computerized RPGs. For those further interested in the topic of food in video games, this episode was partially inspired by Delicious Pixels, a book by Agata Waskiewicz. Finally, thanks to Brooklyn's Sip and Play for allowing me to film my sponsorship clips there. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Shh.